In this video, I will introduce the idea of hypothesis testing and outline the steps involved. Hypothesis testing differs from confidence interval estimation discussed earlier, where we estimate the average or proportion. Here, we will frame each problem as a yes or no question, and we will determine the validity of a statistical claim. While confidence intervals are extremely useful in our understanding, hypothesis tests lend themselves better to decision points where we must choose one of the two alternatives. I will use this example throughout the video to discuss the steps involved in hypothesis testing. A bank has set up a customer service goal that the average waiting time for its customers will be less than two minutes. The bank randomly samples 30 customers and finds the sample average is 112 seconds. Assuming the sample is from a normal distribution and the population standard deviation is 28 seconds, can the bank safely conclude the population average waiting time is less than two minutes? As the last sentence indicates, this is a yes or no question. We want to test the bank's claim whether their average waiting time is less than two minutes or not. The first step for any hypothesis testing is to set up the question. We do this by creating a null hypothesis, the assumption that we are looking to check or disapprove, and its mirror, the alternative hypothesis, which we are looking for the evidence to support. The null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis are two statements that are completely opposite of each other. They are statements about the population parameters, for example, mu for population mean or p for population proportion. The null hypothesis is written as H0 with a subscript 0. It is assumption to be challenged. It is usually the status quo or default. In hypothesis testing, we are looking for evidence to disapprove or reject the null. We can never have enough evidence to approve it or accept it. The null statement always have an equal sign. It could be either e strictly equal or could be less than or equal to or more than equal to. The alternative is written as H with a subscript A. It is the opposite of H0. It is a new claim that we want to prove. We are looking for evidence to prove the alternative HA, meaning rejects the null. Alternative hypothesis HA never has an equal sign in it, so it always be less than or greater than or not equal to. Between them, the null and alternative are mutually exclusive. Here are some examples of HO and HA. HO now hypothesis is generally placed on the top of alternative hypothesis. Note that all the statements are about the population parameters. For example, here is mu. This is also another example about mu. And this is about an example of a population proportion, that's p. They were not about sample statistics, x bar or p bar, you may remember. The sign of inequality in the alternative determines the type of test. For example, over here is strictly not equal to, so it is a two-tailed test. If it's less than, less than, that's a lower-tailed test. If it's strictly greater than, that's going to be called an upper-tailed test. Let's get back to the bank example and set up the hypothesis for that example. The alternative is usually easier to set up compared to the null because it involves the research question we want to test. That is whether the average waiting time is less than two minutes or not. So, alternative hypothesis is mu, the population parameter, less than two minutes, and I convert that to 120 seconds. Because HO is the opposite of alternative hypothesis, HO is going to be mu is greater than or equal to 120 seconds. This is a finalized presentation for step one. Even though we found the alternative hypothesis first, we usually write the null hypothesis in front of alternative hypothesis. From the sign of inequality in the alternative hypothesis, which is less than, we can deduce this is actually a lower-tailed test. 
Generally speaking, in step one of hypothesis testing, we have decided on two statements about the population parameter. Now is the average waiting time is at least 120 seconds. The alternative is the waiting time is less than 120 seconds. The two statements are plotted together here. The now is placed to the right of the alternative because the center is center is more than the center of the alternative statement. In the following steps of the hypothesis testing, we will make use of some useful information we get from the data to determine which of the now and alternative is more likely to be true using the data. This useful information is measured in terms of a test statistic in step two. Step two. Step two is to compute a test statistic, which measures the distance between the now and the evidence from the data. I'm going to present several formulas for calculating test statistic. And I'm going to divide the formulas into whether we're talking about numerical data or categorical data later on. For numerical data, hypothesis tests are mostly about population means, mu. The evidence will be the sample mean from the data, that's x bar. The test statistic could be either a z score or a t score. It's going to be a z score if the population standard deviation sigma is given to us. It's going to be a t score if population standard deviation sigma is not given to us, but we do have sample standard deviation s. For categorical data, tests about the population proportions p. The evidence from the data is sample proportion, that's p bar, and the test statistic is always a z score. Let's go back to example one. So in step two, we try to calculate test statistic, and that's the formula we just learned. So in the numerator, x bar is the sample average. We know that in our sample, 30 customers, the sample average is 112, so we plug it in here. And the next, we find mu zero. Mu zero is the number occurred in the hypothesis. That's 120, so we plug it here. And we do have population standard deviation, which is 28, as that is given to us in the question. Divided by square root of sample size, that's 30 customers. So after doing the calculation, we were able to find the z-score is negative 1.565. The negative value of a z-score indicates that our sample average is less than the null value of 120, which is the number we try to compare with. After we calculate the test statistic, a relative distance measured between the evidence and the null, we want to be able to say whether the evidence is far enough from the null to reject the null. There are two different approaches here in step 3. One approach is called a critical value approach, in which we find a cutoff value. If the evidence is further away than the cutoff from the null, we would reject the null. The second approach is called a p-value approach, in which we calculate a p-value, which is a probability. If this probability is very small, we would reject the null. Let's take a close. Let's start with the critical value approach. We want to find a critical value also known as a cutoff value, that will be determined using a significance level, alpha. Significance level alpha is usually specified in the question. The significance level is actually related to the type 1 error that's going to be discussed later. Once the critical value or the cutoff value is determined, we will compare that with the test statistic from step 2. For our example, the alpha is given to be 1%. We plot a bell curve here, with the center of the bell curve same as 120, which we got it here. Because this is a lower tailed test, if the evidence from the data lies on the right hand side of the null value of 120, we do not have evidence to disapprove the null. If on the other hand side, if the evidence lies on the left hand side of 120, we have some more evidence to reject the null because we are trying to see whether it is indeed less than 120 or not. The critical value is indeed a cutoff value that would allow us sufficient evidence to reject now for the given level of significance.
a one percent significance level represents the lower tail the probability to the left of the critical value is one percent. Using Excel norm dot yin function, we can find negative two point three three has a lower tail the probability of one percent. Our critical value is also negative two point three three. We are done with step three here. It is worth noting that the critical value is a negative score for lower tail test and a positive score for upper tail test. For two tail tests, there are two critical values, one positive number and one negative number. The critical values are determined using alpha, for example, one percent divided by two. I'm going to show you how you can find critical values using several examples later. In step four of the critical value approach, we will compare the test statistic with the critical value. To make a conclusion about whether or not to reject the null, our test statistic is negative one point five six five, and the critical value or the cutoff value is negative two point three three, and the null statement is right here. Because our test statistic is not as far as the critical value to the null. We do not reject the null at one percent significance level. Therefore, we fail to reject the null for this particular example. The conclusion we make in hypothesis testing is either to reject the null or not to reject the null. We will not say we have found enough evidence to accept the null because the null can never be really proven. We will now solve the same problem again using the p-value approach. The first two steps are identical in the p-value approach. The difference lies in step three and step four. The two approaches always lead to the same conclusion. In the p-value approach, we compute a p-value, that is the probability of obtaining our evidence if the null is indeed true. More specifically, the p-value is equal to the probability of obtaining a test statistic. That is further away from the null than our obtained test statistic from the data. If the p-value is very very small, that means it is unlikely for us to obtain our test statistic if the null is true. This actually means the null is unlikely to be true, and we found evidence to reject the null. Once the p-value is determined, we will compare it with alpha that is usually given to us in the question. If it is smaller than alpha, that means if the p-value is less than alpha, we would consider it as being small enough to reject the null. So the first two steps, step one, step two in p-value approach, are identical to that in critical value approach. Our test statistic is found to be negative one point five six five, which is also labeled here on the diagram below. Test statistics that are further away from the null would be those. To the left of negative one point five six five, so the p-value is the lower tail the probability of negative one point five six five. Using Excel norm dot dist, we found this lower tail the probability to be point zero five eight eight. In the last step of p-value approach, we would have to compare p-value with alpha. We just found the p-value to be 0 0.0588, and alpha is given to be 5% in the question. We reject the null if p-value is less than or equal to alpha. We do not reject the null if p-value is more than alpha. This is always true for all types of tests: lower tail tests like this particular example, upper tail tests, or two tail tests. In this example, p-value about 6%. Is more than alpha, so we do not reject the null. We do not reject the null at one percent significance level. Using both critical value approach and the p-value approach, we fail to reject the null. In conclusion, we do not have enough evidence to claim that the population average waiting time is less than two minutes, because we do not reject the null. So we take the null. And now says the population average waiting time is equal to 120 seconds or more than 120 seconds. Here is the summary table for the critical value approach. I highly recommend you to take a screenshot of this page or write it down.
So it summarizes four steps that you need for critical value approach. And the following is the summary table for the p-value approach. It is important to notice that the p-value rejection rule is always the same regardless of what type of test you are doing. If it's a lower tail test, you reject it now if p-value is less than alpha. If it's two tail test or upper tail test, you always reject it now if p-value is less than alpha. In a critical value approach, we compare test statistic with the critical value or cutoff point for a particular significance level. In a p-value approach, we compare p-value associated with the test statistic with the significance level. Although we are comparing different things in these two different approaches, we have been using the same test statistic and same significance level. It is not surprising that the conclusions from these two different approaches are always the same. We either all reject or all fail to reject the null. This also concludes the video, and I will see you in the next one.